Obedience to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Lower Appointed Board of Supervisors, February 14th, 2022. For everybody's, um, just don't want to make everyone aware that this Board of Supervisor meeting is being recorded. Um, before we start, we wanted to offer congratulations and a proclamation to a resident of our community, Ms. Michelle Miller, for her 33 years of dedicated service to the Wissickon Valley Public Library. The proclamation reads, Michelle Miller has served our community at the Wissickon Valley Library for 33 years. And whereas Michelle Miller has planned children's programming and performances at local schools, child care centers, senior centers, and community events. And whereas Michelle Miller has contributed her guitar story performances to our community. And whereas Michelle Miller has always treated all community members, coworkers, and children with dignity, respect, and a caring attitude. Now, therefore, be it therefore resolved, the Board of Supervisors and the employees of the Lo Township of Lower Gwinnett hereby recognize and honor with our deepest appreciation Michelle Miller for her years of fairness and compassionate commitment to Lower Gwinnett Township and its surrounding communities. Thank you and congratulations to Michelle Miller on her retirement. We'll make sure that we get that to her. She was unable to be with us tonight. Um, the first order of business is a receipt of the minutes for January 22nd, 2022. Um, have all supervisors had the opportunity to look at the minutes? Yes. I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. So I'm a, a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Receipt of the invoice history for December 2021. Have all super, um, board of supervisors had the ability to look at the invoice history? Yes. Is there any questions? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Aye. <laughs> There's a little delay. <laughs> Mike gives him a slight delay. <laughs> <laughs> Next is um, an authorization to accept RFP for auditing services. Um, is our finance director on remotely? Perhaps he is not. Um, so I think you can see on the screen above the RP was sent to six accounting firms with a significant government practice in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, the, the date of this memo is February 11, 2022. This is for a three year term. Uh, yeah. Okay. Three year term. Sorry. For 2021, 2022, 2023 auditing services. So it was posted on the website, advertised in the newspaper. It was sent to six firms. Three did not respond. Of the three, um, BBD, Barbara King Thornton, and I don't know how to say the last one, but we'll call it Axelrod, <laughs> um, um, returned um, proposals. Barbara King has been our auditor for the past three years. Uh, or is it five years? years. Five years. Uh, we went a uh, three-year contract, and then we extended it another two during the uh, COVID. Okay. So only thing of confirmation that I questioned um, was in the initial finance report from our auditor. My understanding was that one of the one of the firms did not, or I believed one of the firms did not understand scope. So I was just seeking clarification. All of them understood scope. All of them do provide municipal work in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, so Barbicane, BBD, and Axelrod are still all three applicable to provide those services to us. Is that correct? Yes, we ha I had the finance director uh, vet all three companies. We've had Barbicane for at least five years um, um, and all of them are satisfactory. Okay. So I guess, um, do, is there any questions from the board? 
Yeah. Um, so, Craig, you mentioned that you might look into the BBD uh, bid because it was lower. Did you find any? Um, we found no discrepancies on that, and uh, we have contacted other municipalities that were on their list for BBD, and um, all came back positive. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? So we have those proposals in front of us being no questions. Does anyone want to make a motion? Can we hear from Craig about? Yeah, do, we, do we have a recommendation from the finance yeah, director? From recommendation. I did ask that and it appears that there is no recommendation. They're all found to be satisfactory auditors, but I don't want to speak, you can go ahead. Correct, there is no um, firm recommendation. All three are um, auditing services that are uh, do great business. I mean, if you want to look at just the price, um, BBD came out the cheapest. I mean, Barbicane, we've been here as- it's significantly cheaper. Correct. Do we have any sense of why that is? How, how are they able to do it less expensively than the other two? Um, I guess without giving away company secrets, um, <laughs> they, uh, they can do it because most of it is um, virtual. So they don't have the, people coming into the buildings. So they uh, use less staff members. Yeah, and they're competitively bidding. Correct. I mean, the only concerning thing is in the comments, it does say the proposal was out of line and will clarify scope and check references. So we're just clarifying that we did clarify, I mean, our finance director did clarify the scope and references were checked. Yes. Okay. Question from the public. Uh, how do these numbers compare with the last contract we were dated? That was about CLA? No, it was Barbicane. Oh, okay, perfect. So how does that compare? Um, very favorable. Uh, it's about, they were about $25,000 per year, roughly. Okay, so we're up about that. Dr. Bruce, okay. nobody can hear you. I don't know if you want, if you can come to the podium, people online can't hear you. Oh, you don't want to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I would just say um, I think it's a good idea after five years to hire a new auditing firm just to get fresh eyes on our books. Um, I would agree with that. And all things being equal, and it sounds like they are in terms of confidence and quality of work, I make a motion to appoint DBD as our auditor for how many years? Three years. For a three year term. I'll second that. We have a motion and we have a second in front of us to authorize BBD for our auditor for a three year term. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> motion <laughs> passes that we're gonna audit, we're gonna authorize BBD LLP for our auditor for the next three years. Um, next up on the agenda is to authorize our solicitor and staff to work on language agreement with the Birkenheimer to release the exclusive rights as tax collector for LSD and BPT. Um, we did see a presentation from eCollect uh, last, no, two weeks ago at our January 24th meeting. Um, they presented what their organization does and provides. The issue is that currently right now, Birkenheimer does have exclusive rights as the tax collector for LSDT and BPT. So this authorization would allow our solicitor and staff to work on language to come to an agreement with Birkenheimer to release those exclusive rights, allowing eCollect um, to do the audit and discovery work that they presented to us at our last meeting. Um, does any, any board of supervisors, anyone on the board of supervisors have any questions? I have a question. Um, I'm not 
Just sure I understand why we would not just go with um, uh, Berkheimer for this process instead of hiring a new additional company. So this authorization is not to, um, this is the first authorization. So it's not to do anything related to not going with Berkheimer. It's to release the exclusive rights that Berkheimer has on collecting the business privilege tax and the local mercantile tax. Um, Berkentire collects all taxes. They don't necessarily do audit and discovery. They're not necessarily looking to see whatever business, and as he presented, I guess, two weeks ago at this point, or maybe a little bit more, um, entities that are not in our township for a long period of time, but are doing work in our township for a long period of time, primarily construction work or road improvements, those kinds of things. They're not setting up shop here. They're not establishing the fact that they're a business. Um, Berkheimer has never, I guess, been incentivized to look at business privilege tax as it relates to those businesses or organizations specifically. They're primarily, um, and this is without going through their contract in detail, they're primarily um, collecting the taxes on established businesses. So this organization, eCollect, does go after that. And they're incentivized because of the amount of percentage that they, they do take if they do find it. Um, it hasn't been something that has been looked at in our township. We do collect the business privilege tax, which is not something that all townships or municipalities do collect. So we're in a unique situation where we have the ability to go after this, and there's no time frame limit on time frame to actually do the audit and discovery as it relates to business privilege tax for people who have provided the services in our municipality. Okay, but I was under the impression there was a substantial difference between the commission, each of these companies charges. There is. Mm -hmm. there is. It's 20% for eCollect versus 2.25, I believe, for Berkhamer. Okay, I, I'm just not sure I understand why we're why we're proceeding along these lines. Is there some other reason besides the contractor tax that you have in mind? Mm, it's not, it's, so they only are paid if they actually recover money. So that's the first thing. So their goal is to actually find organizations or contractors who have provided the service in our municipality and have never paid the business privilege tax. It's kind of tedious work. Um, and I don't think it's a priority for Berkheimer. This is my assumption. I don't know for certain. Um, that is why there's entities that specifically and only do this type of work. But I mean, has, has Berkheimer ever found these um, business privilege taxes that haven't been paid? I mean, have they ever done that for us? Craig, do you know that? Without identifying the businesses, with us at not identifying the businesses, you mean? Well, I, I'm just, you know, as to Tessie's question, why aren't we going with Berkheimer? I guess my question to Craig or whomever is, has Berkheimer ever identified and found us money that wasn't originally collected, but that we were owed? Uh, recently, um, we have sent over um, building permits and UNOs in the last couple of years. The first year that was sent over, they recovered a, roughly about $165,000 of businesses that were not uh, licensed, or not licensed, but um, not registered in the township. Um, so they have been doing that for the last two or three years. Um, so and, and Berkheimer can, can do um, the business privilege tax and go after the different contractors, um, we would be just providing the same information to them that we would to e-collect. So you're making a distinction between established businesses, brick and mortar, versus contractors that come in on a temporary basis and do work. Correct. When we did the, you, when you send out the use and occupancy permits, that's for people that are established here in brick and mortar. Yes. Okay. So regardless of what type of business you're levying the tax against, under Berkheimer's commission, 2%, we keep more of that money than we would if eCollect was doing it for us. Well, yes. Right. But it sounds like Berkheimer isn't doing that except for brick and mortar businesses. I don't think they've been directed to. 
Correct. Most municipalities do not go after the contractors. We'll say um, it's not business friendly. We'll call it, but um, they can. But they have to be directed by the township, and it has not been directed by the township at this and, point. And how long do they does the contractor have to be doing business in Lower Gwinnett Township to be subject to this tax? I believe 15 it's days. 15 days. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so we're talking about um, long term contractors doing reno work in Springhouse Innovation Park versus a mom and pop contractor renovating somebody's basement that might take three, four, or five weeks. They both are subject to this tax. Yes. Yes, unless they pay it to some other municipality. Um, well, I think that's fairly, they have to collect it uniformly, but I, I don't know. I, I, as a township, I know we've worked very hard over the past 10 to 12 years to kind of um, soften our image of being not contractor, not developer, not business friendly. And I think this goes against that grain. So I'm not um, too keen on this. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any opinion on that. Certainly with established businesses, we're absolutely sure. But um, contractors coming in to do work, um, I don't know. I, I just don't think that's- Then why do we have the ordinance on the books at all? If we're not gonna collect, what's the point of it? I'm correct in understanding that a lot of municipalities surrounding us do not have the business privilege tax. Uh, some do not, and then some, yes, some do. Okay. We have so the rule is you have to pay the business privilege tax for the privilege of doing business in Lower Gwinnett, but we don't collect it unless you're a business, a brick and mortar business. Is that sort of the deal? That would be correct. So we give an advantage to people that are just coming in here short term, as opposed to people who've decided to make Lower Gwinnett their home? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Well, you're talking about contractors that come into Lower Gwinnett Township to do work for Lower Gwinnett businesses or right. residents. Um, right, so the, so the contractor who doesn't have to pay Lower Gwinnett business privilege tax, the contractor who's not here can do the job cheaper, right? I mean, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't understand if we have it, if this is the law, why we don't enforce it and does it give people who have businesses in lower Gwedded a competitive disadvantage because they have to pay the business tax and Berkheimer goes after them. But they and, may be paying in a, in a different township but I, I okay, agree. But we don't we don't know that <laughs> we don't know that and Berkheimer doesn't know that and it sounds like nobody knows that and if we hire e-collect then we'll at least know it and E-Collect seems to think for whatever reason, based on, I guess, their history, that it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So certainly we wanna be friendly to business, but we wanna be fair to our businesses. And if it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're owed, it seems like something we would wanna explore collecting, or am I wrong? Well, if that's in fact the number, yeah, but then it gets back to, do we want to say 2% or 20%? Yeah, that, that's my point too. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see why we can't explore doing this with Berkheimer. The difference in uh, commission is significant in this case. I don't know why they haven't been doing it in the past. If we just haven't asked them to, it seems to me like an, an obvious thing to do, but uh, I mean, that they wouldn't have to be told to do it. But uh, in any case, I, I would like to table this until we can check and see which of these companies is going to do better business for us. I guess just to, to comment on your point, Tessie, if Berkheimer has had the ability to do this all along, my concern is um, that they haven't been. And this company brought to our attention that there may be a significant amount of money that we haven't been collecting. 
um, and, and are offering the opportunity for us to, to you know, to, they can do the groundwork and they can seek that money out. Um, yes, it's a larger commission, but I think it's a lot more work. And that's why perhaps Berkheimer hasn't done it to begin with. If you look at the Berkheimer contract, it doesn't exempt out certain, you know, contractors or other people who should have been paying the business privilege tax. Um, so there's nothing in there that expressly states lower Gwennon, you know, needs to, you know, direct us to collect taxes from these particular contractors. Their contract, in fact, is quite broad. They are the sole collector of the business privilege tax. And so it concerns me that they haven't been doing the entire job. Um, and I don't know where that disconnect, you know, I don't know where that disconnect is, but. No, I, I I take your point and I would be concerned if I found out somebody had, I had hired wasn't doing their job, but I, don't they have the contract for the whole county? Um, I mean, it, it's, yes. it seems like this is maybe something on us that we have not asked them to do it. I don't know that for a fact, but if it's on us, the township, to make sure that they're executing what we're paying them for, then we need to follow up on this because there's a significant discount with going uh, on this contract that we're already paying for. And so I think we should explore why this hasn't been done in the past and how we can get these um, this situation remedied. I fully agree that I would be happy to go with the other company if Berkheimer is not able to do this. The, the other company I, is, is highly incentivized to find money because that's how they get paid. Um, so I, I do agree that they probably are very hungry to explore, um, you know, finding more contractors to tax. Is that, is that exclusively their business? Yeah. Yes. Well, no, I'm sorry, that isn't. The, to Janine's to Janine's to Janine's point, this, at least as I understand it, this is what Berkheimer was supposed to do without us asking, unless we've specifically told them not to do that. And is that the case? Have we told Berkheimer not to collect from the out of area contractors? And maybe that's why they're not doing it. No, I don't think Does we've ever told. I don't think we've ever told them not to collect it. I just believe we would have had to um, tell them that we want them to collect it, and then start sending them every permit that we receive. I, I that just seems that I don't. It just seems strange. I, look, I'm for exploring whether Berkheimer can do it, but. It seems strange that we should ask them to do what we hired them to do. do, do you know, we don't have to ask them to, to collect um, the school tax. I mean, I, I know because I pay it and I know I get stuff from them or the real estate tax. So I guess I'm not sure why they're not doing this, but I don't have a problem. I, I don't disagree with Tessie that we can table it to try to figure these questions out, but I don't think we should delay having Berkheimer release the exclusive rights so that we don't waste any time. So I, I think we should approve this and maybe not and delay the next one, but I, we should be able to hit the ground running if and when we decide to use eCollect. We shouldn't have to go back to the drawing board to ask Berkheimer to release their rights. Well, on the flip side of that, depending yeah. on what we decide to do about this collection, if we decide to go with Berkheimer, we just amend or execute a new contract, taking away the exclusivity and telling them that they need to collect the tax. So I, I would just say keep the status quo until we uh, finish our ex exploration here. Yeah. So Neil, can you give any insight uh, as to why they may not have been collecting this tax in the past? I, I really have no idea. That kind of predates me. Okay. Um, I don't, I have no idea why they haven't been collecting it. I can tell you that 
without divulging any client confidences, I have contractor clients who have been paying it in Upper Marion and White Marsh um, almost always as a result of an audit um, where they attempt to evade the tax. And by virtue of an audit, they've been forced to pay it. And it can be a substantial amount of money, but you need somebody to dig into the documents really deeply. You need to find out where their base of operations is, whether they pay to other municipalities, whether it needs to be allocated if they're a company that does business in different states, for example. And it's not just contractors. There are probably going to get yelled at for this, but there are investment, real estate investment partnerships um, that own real estate uh, that are out of state partnerships, but own real estate in Lower Gwented that may be mm -hmm. subject to the tax. I know one of my clients was uh, compelled to pay a substantial amount of money to Upper Marion Township uh, in that particular case. And can you, uh, without re you know, um, revealing anything uh, confidential, say that it was Berkheimer? Um, it, 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 Upper Marion does not use Berkheimer. They use an accounting firm um, to do their audits. Um, I don't recall who it was in White Marsh. Uh, it might have been Berkheimer. Does Berkheimer do the audits? Or they? I think in White Marsh they did, but in Upper Marion, I know for a fact it wasn't Berkheimer. It was an accounting firm. So the community and Neil, house. if we took away the exclusive right for Berkheimer to do it, it wouldn't prevent Berkheimer from doing it. It would just allow somebody else to do it if we so chose, right? Yeah, and Berkheimer pointed out that there are other municipalities where they work together with eCollect. Um, they gave us a list, Plains Township, uh, apparently near Wilkes-Barre, the Wilkes-Barre School District. Um, so those are cases in which Berkheimer either did not have an exclusive or they gave up their exclusive and worked together with eCollect, I think principally on these contractor type issues, but it may have even gone beyond that. Um, so Berkheimer told uh, Craig and I that um, they would be willing to do a carve out, for example, in their agreement, give up their exclusive and allow eCollect to go after contractors and maybe others. Um, so there are other situations where these two companies have worked together. And I just want to be clear, it's not eCollect is not proposing simply to go after contractors. It's anything that could have been missed. Um, correct? It's it's they would be sort of auditing the entire business privilege tax collection. Yeah, as I understand it, they're specialists and kind of digging in where you normally wouldn't look, I guess is the best way to describe it. Right. So the understanding is that auditing specifically in, in the discovery of the audit in the discovery process of auditing is their specialty. Right. Which is why they're generally tasked with doing it because it's a little bit more in, involved. Than you have just to do a lot of homework, a lot of analysis. I mean, that's what I gathered from just reading their materials online and what they sent us and exploring other municipalities in Pennsylvania that have utilized them. It's not as simple as saying, Berkheimer, please do this for us. That's my understanding. That's yeah, I think that's right. Is there any other questions from the Board of Supervisors? Is there any questions from the public? Yeah. So we don't have a motion before us. Does anyone want to make a motion? And this is really truly just- I move offered. to authorize the solicitor and staff to work on language agreement with Berkheimer to release their exclusive rights as tax collector for LSD and BPT. Is I'll, there... I'll second the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. The motion carries. So the next um, agenda item is the authorization to accept e-collect upon updating the tax agreement with Berkheimer. So this is, is beyond the 
the working on the language with Berkheimer to release their exclusive rights as tax collector. This is actually accepting the agreement um, that would be developed by our solicitor and staff with Berkheimer. Acceptance of e-collect agreement upon updating the tax agreement with Berkheimer. Is there any questions from the Board of Supervisors? The, I'm sorry. The only the only question I have is, if, you know, to Tessie's point about um, giving Berkheimer the opportunity, since apparently we the, we may have needed to direct them to fully collect the tax, and and maybe for whatever reason that wasn't communicated, give them the opportunity to do it. How will we know that they've fully performed their obligations? I mean, I know Craig, you mentioned when we started sending them some of the more recent permit applications, they were able to obtain um, the business privilege checks from those various contractors, but that's not them going back in time and um, collecting from- They, they the could, but with the- with the UNOs, they went back, I believe they were able to go back three years. Okay. So they did go back and audit and yes. collect. Okay. I guess, yeah, that's just my question is how would we feel comfortable that they are doing all of the work that eCollect has promised to do for their higher fee? Is that a question for Neil? I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> yeah. I mean they have just, been as far as contractor taxes, but this particular step of this process, I think is what concerns Tessie and I and maybe others that we need to kind of dig down a little bit just on Berkheimer side, um, as far as the uh, tax on contractors to decide whether indeed we want to stay with Berkheimer and the lesser commission or move over to e-collect. But it's only for the, we're only talking about one aspect. We're not talking about all tax collection. We're not, we're only talking no, about- No, we, we got stuff. that. Um, okay. But, um, so Neil, when you spoke to them, did, they didn't say, the Berkheimer, I guess Berkheimer, they didn't say, oh yeah, you need to hire those guys because that's not something we're going to do. <laughs> I didn't say something like that. No, they didn't say that. <laughs> no, they weren't giving up that. <laughs> But they were going to stay staying in the way of the township if they wanted to hire eclot. So, oh, they wouldn't stand in the way if we correct. Okay. Yeah, they weren't going to put a, a roadblock in. At least they said they weren't. <laughs> yeah, they were talking about carving out from their agreement the contractor issue. Mm -hmm. Did they give you the totality of municipalities they're currently working with? Ecollect. Yeah. Um. Uh, I don't think so. You, you checked the reference though. Yes, yes. Did they give you the totality of the number? What's the they number? gave me a, a list. I'm, I'm assuming it was everyone that they used. Do you know how many approximately? I don't. I would say there's probably 35. 35 municipalities in Pennsylvania that are currently using eCollect. Yes. But we don't know. And that's off the top of my head. I'm, okay. We don't know if they're also using Berkheimer. I know some are because some are in Montgomery County. Okay. Do you know approximately how many in Montgomery County? I do not. Okay. <laughs> um. I'd like to make a motion to table this uh, so we can, so I can understand better uh, the full picture of why this hasn't been done in the past and um, how uh, Berkheimer collaborates with eCollect and, you know, some information from people who are using both of the entities, if we can gather such information. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. All those abstaining. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I was, I was muted. I guess so you're waiting for me. No, I, I, I voted aye. Yeah, that's fine. I, I think if we're gonna like, we should have a plan of what we're gonna do between now and the next meeting to confirm our concerns or questions about Berkheimer. I mean, we should task someone to do it so that it gets done because I don't wanna to come to the next meeting with the same question and we're still leaving money out there. So at this point we can authorize staff to, oh, it's not on the agenda. Um, Neil, can we get a vote to authorize staff to conduct specific tasks since it's not on the agenda? 
and this is the only time publicly we can meet so about this specific topic. I think we can do that as a part of the as a part of the staff to work on the language. Yes. Okay. So specifically, I don't know, Tessie, if you since you were you brought up the motion specifically, what tangible things are you looking to get from staff so that you feel more comfortable, or just so that you have knowledge? I would like to understand if Berkheimer can do this work as well as eCollect if we ask them to do it and we provide them the necessary documentation or, um, and, and, and to understand that, I guess we would need to get input from other municipalities that are using them. I think we'd also need to know, I mean, of course, I would suspect they're going to say we can do it. <laughs> and we to. don't know if the other, I don't know if the other municipalities have any alternatives, but I would want to know from Berkheimer how exactly they're going to do it. I would like to know specifically if they have an auditing team that has successfully done this anywhere. Um, and I just would like a, the comprehensive list of municipalities in Montgomery County that use eCollect and if they also interface with Berkheimer. Craig, do these, are these reasonable asks? You can throw in microphones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm just writing it all down, yes. <laughs> okay. Is there any other suggestions or requests from the Board of Supervisors? Okay. So we'll have that update prior to our next meeting, which is two weeks from today. Thank, Thank you. you. We have tabled the, the authorization of the acceptance of the collect agreement. Moving on to building and zoning. Um, there is a request for additional waiver of sidewalk for the Goddard School. Um, and there's council. Yeah. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Is there a microphone? Can you just? Well, there is not, but I can project. <laughs> okay. I'm Elena Villarre, and I'm from Community Ops. You have to use it so that people on mic can hear you. Fair enough. Um, I am here on behalf of Best Place LLC. Um, looks like you have the letter from our office, um, which has attached to it the plan that was approved by PennDOT. Um, this plan had been approved um, by the Board of Supervisors, and we were seeking approval. Um, for various things. The PennDOT plan, which is what you have in front of you, has a very, very, very slight variation from the plan that had been approved by the board. Um, the only difference, um, I don't know if it's easier to see in front of you, but there is a request or there was an approval by PennDOT for a crosswalk through the drive, the driveway that is now on the right that is on the northern side. Those two parallel lines that go across the driveway is indicating the crosswalk that PennDOT has approved that was not in the original plan. That is the full change is put in a crosswalk. Um, so I would just ask the Board of Supervisors um, to grant the motion to approve the plan as were approved by PennDOT. The prior plan, um, if there's any questions or difference, is originally it came down, I believe, with um, a ramp for handicap accessibility. And then there was a slight division between our driveway and the one next door that now has a crosswalk that goes across the middle of the driveway. Can you point to it on the plan, please? Sure. Um, I'm having that then. So oh. I'm holding up the equivalent version, which is the driveway, what is on my right up there, right there. Yes, those two parallel lines are indicating a crosswalk that will go across the two driveways. So the lines that move down to our driveway. That then goes across, and then the lines that come down next door are the driveway next door. We are fine with putting the crosswalk all the way through, um, but that is a slight variation from the original plan. What well, could I just ask clarification? So, are you removing the ramp and only putting in the crosswalk? So, it is so the original plan, there was. A little closer. <laughs> <laughs> so the original 
plan are up here. There is just a division. So here's our driveway, here is the driveway next door. There is a space in between. Um, I have overhead photos that show that there's sort of a green area. This would now have a clear right of passage, right of walkway. And this being a sidewalk, it is just in the purview of the board of supervisors. But it is simply a clear path to all of it. It's not a crosswalk, it's a sidewalk. Or are you saying this is the it original? Is, it goes across the driveway, so it would, I don't know that it's separately shaped as a sidewalk, so it would be a sidewalk. It's a painted and, crosswalk. Okay. It's a painted crosswalk. And this is not the original, this is what you're asking. This is the original, that is what we are asking, that is what was approved by that doctor. So you're, this was going to be a painted sidewalk, is what you're saying? This was going to be a regular sidewalk. A regular sidewalk. And what they're proposing is a painted crosswalk. A painted crosswalk, okay. Oh, wait a minute. That's more than a very, very, very little yeah, change. Yeah, that's, that's different. So this is a sidewalk, <laughs> an actual sidewalk, and this is a painted crosswalk. But it's going across the driveway. So there is a sidewalk, comes to a driveway. Uh -huh. Then there was a little bit of an area in between. I can show you on, on an overhead photo that it essentially was still driveway. Uh -huh. And then there is a second driveway. It is simply going across the walk so there would not have been a paved area there. It's still a driveway. And PennDOT wants that? They want that? This is the, what is up on the screen is what was approved by PennDOT. Okay, so, yeah, all right. And so, did you guys all see that? I don't know, were you able to see it, Mike? I got the gist of it. Okay, and you can see it, Janine? Mm-hmm. So what was the recommendation from our, um, our engineer? Yeah, uh, Tim Hirsch could not be here tonight, but Chad Dixon is on Zoom. Okay. Or on online. Chad, what was the recommendation? Um, I believe the recommendation was if the um, if sidewalk inappropriate ADA ramps could not be um, placed in this area then a waiver would have to be requested. Um, I guess the one point of clarification in regards to your, your PennDOT permit um, that you've received, is that, is that the permit you received for the, the prior proposal for the site or for the revised permit that you've been um, seeking over the last several weeks with PennDOT? This is what was recently received regarding the openings into Bethlehem Pike as part of the approval um, for the, the traffic planning, my understanding. And what this what was date just received that? in very recent time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just needed clarification because the township didn't receive notification on that. Yeah, um, so at, the, at this point, um, if the if the township um, didn't want to grant the waiver, they would be required to go back to, to PennDOT and amend um, their permit. But the ADA requirements are still fulfilled. I, I will be honest, I don't know the, but my understanding is that the, the curb would have come to the edge of the driveway. I don't believe that there was an existing sidewalk going across the driveway. It would have been flat. My understanding from looking at the existing pictures, I, I will admit that I'm I am not an engineer. <laughs> I would assume that PennDOT would give you a permit if it weren't compliant. Correct. And what is existing in those? So this what is currently existing is the driveway, and then there is where it curves around. There's a bit of a, a grassy area, but it's it's back a little bit that kind of separates the two driveways. And then there is the second driveway next to it. This is just going across the front, but there, it, I don't believe it's any significant change from how it currently looks. Uh, the overhead photo that I saw didn't even have a current paved walkway, mm -hmm. but that is just me up as a, a lay observer, not as the engineer. <laughs> I guess another question for clarification, the existing condition doesn't include a painted crosswalk through this area. Is the plan you're showing on the screen, will, will an actual painted crosswalk um, be provided um, 
when you do the work associated with this permit? That's my understanding. I don't know how there would be a crosswalk other than a painted crosswalk. Again, that is a, a lay answer. Yeah, I just wanted to, like I said, I wanted to clarify because the existing condition does not have a paint, painted crosswalk through this area. That, that was my understanding. This seemed to be an additional request by PennDOT um, above what is currently. Okay. So Neil, and this might be, I'm asking you Neil to, because you did write the agreement that they agreed to. Can you kind of outline what the, the major difference is and the ramifications of that difference? Meaning our initial proposal that they agreed to included a sidewalk that was ADA compliant across, am I, am I correct in understanding that it was an um, ADA compliant sidewalk across that opening or the driveway as they're calling it? it? It must have been including curb as well because no waiver was granted in the initial resolution. Okay, so it was an ADA compliant sidewalk with, you know, like the ramp up and, and that kind of thing. Um, so this painted sidewalk is not a, what, what is the major difference? Because I can't understand why we're having a painted crosswalk versus an ADA compliant sidewalk. I'll defer to Chad on that one. Sure. Yeah, and I think where this, I think where this issue sort of originated from was some of the initial plan submissions that were um, made to the township um, before they went for made their uh, PennDOT HOP um, application showed the curbing being extended out to meet the existing uh, curb on uh, Bethlehem Pike. Um, and that would have included a grass area um, extending out along that new um, curbing that would go to Bethlehem Pike. Um, at that point in time, the plan didn't show a sidewalk going through that area and a, and a waiver was not requested at that time. So I think the assumption, um, you know, from, from staff's perspective was that that was a plan revision that was going to happen later um, where that sidewalk would be um, added in that area. Um, in, in recent, in more recent weeks, um, the plan has been revised to show what you see here, um, which um, has this, has the curb basically extending out to um, the existing asphalt area and then stopping um, before it gets to the existing curb um, along Bethlehem Pike. <clears throat> so just for my clarification, we've, we've mulled this around a lot now, but before you went to PennDOT, there was going to be a sidewalk. Now you've come from PennDOT and there's not going to be a sidewalk. There's going to be a painted crosswalk. There is still a sidewalk. There is a sidewalk all across the front of this. This okay. is covering a driveway area. I would think the only difference would be that little tiny knoll area in the middle. Again, that's my understanding, but the driveways haven't moved. They're still in the same location. Uh, yes, but what we're talking about is the sidewalk. Is there still a sidewalk that goes all the way across the frontage of the property? Yes, this is just covering the driveway area. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely a sidewalk that goes, there's two driveways. There's a sidewalk that goes between the two of them. Then you come to the driveway, you have this crosswalk area, which now extends not just through our property, but into the property next door. Okay. Did the, um, be, the building and zoning committee, um, was this new proposal? presented to them, did they have a recommendation or did they make a recommendation to the board? It is in the minutes. We were following the recommendation of staff. However, uh, Jim is not here. Oh. I, did, I didn't get his written recommendation or I didn't oh. see it in the, in the minutes. Um, I did ask for it, but it, it seems that we were following the recommendation of staff, which was to go with our original plan. Which was the sidewalk. Which was the sidewalk. Um, and, you know, Mike, you were on that call. Is that consistent with what you remember? That's what I see in the minutes. Yeah, it is, but I'm not sure I understood it to the degree of specificity yeah. I understand it now. 
Yes, I, the way you're explaining yeah. it is very different than the way it was explained to us in the B and Z committee. Um, that that was my confusion. And the letter's not there. particularly clear about what the minor change is. <laughs> I mean, it's very hard to tell from the letter and the attached plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the, it is the a minor bit. change is rather than a concrete sidewalk going across the drive. We're painting it. We're just painting a crosswalk. I, is that correct? I, I would defer to the engineer for the interpretation on this. And granted, I don't have my engineer present. But in the original plan, I don't believe there was a sidewalk going across the front of the driveways. This is additional, as I understand it. <laughs> well, then what are you waving? When when this <laughs> you didn't ask for the you didn't ask for the um, waiver, even though the plan showed no side my my request is actually to simply approve the plans as now presented by yeah. PennDOT. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Uh, but I would err to the engineer's interpretation of the original plan. Yeah, this it, it's even though to you it's a very very minor thing or however many berries you said. Um, it, it seems like it's still a point of confusion as to what the before and afters and so forth. So I, I would make a motion to table this until we get our engineers input. Yeah, I would like a very concrete interpretation of what we're approving before no we approve it. <laughs> what did you say? No pun intended. No pun intended. So I'm going to second that motion to table until we can get a uh, a clear idea of exactly what because you wouldn't have brought it to us if it wasn't. I understand you're saying it's very, very, very minor. Um, Three varies. <laughs> but we can't discern that it's very, very, very minor. And I don't think any of us have the expertise of an engineer. And our engineer is not here tonight, and you didn't bring your engineer with you tonight. So I would feel more comfortable. That's just my opinion. I would second that tabling. All those, is there any other questions for the board of supervisors? If, if I could get clarification of what our concern is, so I would be able to, to get the engineer's clarification of what was, to, to me, this is adding safety as opposed, this is clarifying something. But I, I'm curious what the, super, you know, what the question is so I can make sure that we have this clarified for the next hearing. I, I think for me, at least, the discrepancy is in the, and I, I wasn't, I, I'm not on the, B and Z committee, so I wasn't there, but but the discrepancy in the explanation in the minutes is different than mm -hmm. than this presentation, and so I would want, and we don't know what Jim yeah. recommended yeah. in terms of the waiver. So that's my my question is just the description in the letter and the description in the minutes is we, different. Yeah, at, at the, at the yeah. B and Z meeting, we did not have this letter, and we did not have the visual. Um, so we were going with the narrative that our planner, um, and this is my recollection, my, our engineer was giving us. Um, the way he described it to us, um, his recommendation was to um, follow our original approved plan. From what you're presenting, it does seem minor, but I guess my concern is, is it accurate that the sidewalk will continue across the frontage and this is just going to be a painted crosswalk, which seems totally reasonable, but it differs from what he told us in our meeting, if that makes sense. So it's either sidewalk or stripes. And from what B and Z is saying that they walked away from that meeting, not really the advice is being conflicted between the minutes and this letter. I don't think we've seen the pen dot approval either. We didn't see which any would be helpful to have. Yeah. We didn't have any of this at the B and Z. It was just verbal from my understanding, my recollection. Is that true? That's true, Craig. We didn't have anything. It was no, verbal. No, we did not. Okay. So it was verbally explained to us in a way where seeing it differs from what was originally explained. So there's a motion in front of us at the table. We have a, a motion. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there any other questions from the board of supervisors? Could I just add something to the motion yes. to um, place this on the agenda for February 28th? Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. that would actually be my my sole request Absolutely. because we cannot take action on this, and that's why I think part of the 
I don't want to say issue is that we want we tried to put this on today's agenda as soon as we got this because we cannot take action to build and to improve this premises until this goes through. And I think at its heart, this is going to, with a clarified explanation, this is, in my opinion, what makes sense. I understand the board's concern, but yes, I would ask it be put on as, as soon Absolutely. as possible. Yeah. And, and that is our priority. That's why I put it on the agenda without seeing the letter and seeing the pen dot plan. And I appreciate that. No worries. So um, anybody else have any other questions? No. Questions from the public? Online? Um, <clears throat> can I make a comment? That sure. Is my, that is know. my client. Can you state your um, your name? Uh, your David Go David Goldstein. Okay, Mr. Goldstein, go for. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, oh, I can't. Uh, no video. Okay, sorry. Didn't realize that. Um, I, obviously, I've been listening. Um, we we do have. Uh, I, I'm a little surprised that you haven't presented with our um, approval on the supplement. Um, the configuration you see now um, is specifically um, uh, part of the supplement uh, approval and PennDOT's uh, plan to us as to what we have to build. Um, the um, additional ramp that we're talking about here, um, if we were to include that on a little bit of uh, grass area between <clears throat> our property and the property next door wouldn't be adequate enough to, uh, uh, I, I believe, um, actually do a, a handicap ramp up and down. And we don't own the property uh, past our property line, uh, which is, you know, would make it very difficult to do. Um, and um, the difference between the original plan and what you're seeing now is really part of what PennDOT had required us to do. I, I didn't realize up to this point you hadn't seen the uh, approved plan uh, from uh, our traffic engineers, or I honestly thought that um, along the entire um, time this was being done that um, your engineers were 100% uh, involved in the conversation. I, I actually thought that they had already had a copy of the plan. As things went along, I believed that uh, your engineers were 100% previous to what we were doing. No, I appreciate that, that input, um, Mr. Goldstein. I can't say for certain if our engineer was or was not. He's not present, so he can't speak for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to assume that he was a part of the process. However, I know that we did not see this plan at our B&D meeting. And we did not have this plan presented to us as a board until this past Friday. However, we still put it on the agenda because we had the understanding that this is timely and time sensitive and we didn't want to delay or be a part of a delay unnecessarily. But after you know having your hearing your council's representation of, of what's actually changing versus how it was relayed to us from our engineer, just as a little minor concern. So like I said, I don't believe that we have the final proof or the final PennDOT plan or we did not have it. Um, so now that we have all of the necessary information, um, just in, in concert with our, our engineer, hopefully we you know timely can come to a resolution and this will be on our next agenda. Just for clarification, this is the PennDOT plan. What is on the screen? Yes, we didn't have it until Friday. I, I don't think we had it much before that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm. And I apologize for the delay unnecessarily, uh, Mr. Goldstein. I'm just, uh, when would our next opportunity to uh, discuss this be? Two there. weeks from today, which I think is the 28th? 28th. 28th of February. I see. It'll be a Monday. I see. Okay. Um, any other questions from the public or comments? So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? I don't know. You can't hear me. I, sorry. Okay. All right. The motion is Sometimes passed. We're, ta we're tabling the request for additional waiver of silo for the Goddard School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have a presentation by Chief Paul Kenny on community policing efforts in Lower Gwinnett. Good 
Good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. We're going to be real quick. Everybody has dinner plans. Uh, I just want to, Craig. <laughs> I just want to take you through uh, a short presentation of something that I presented prior to uh, the budget and just give you a little update on where we're going and follow through with a little bit so the public sees it. Some board members haven't seen it. So I'm going to fly through it. If you have questions, I'll gladly stop and answer them. So Jamie's going to try and keep up with me. <laughs> if we go long, it's Jamie's fault. <laughs> so the, the first slide there shows the present makeup of the Lower Ground Police Department. The chief, lieutenant, you have four sergeants that run four squads. Then we have a bunch of officers underneath the sergeants, a detective, and an SRO. That makes up the 18 members of this police department. Next. So you'll see there's a, it's uneven there. The two, first two columns have an additional officer. And what we do with those two officers at the bottom is they work a straight day work rotation Monday, every day of the week, there's an extra officer on day work. We're traditionally a busier department during the daytime hours. Uh, population increases during the daytime. Uh, workload increases during the daytime. So it, it allows us to have on paper on a schedule four officers working daytime every day of the week. Uh, detective, there's one detective assigned there. There's the SRO is a school resource officer who works at Wissahickon High School. This is the current staffing. It says 2021 and has not changed. The things to point out here, there's 18 personnel on this list, 18 employees in the police department. If you look at how we've designated the color there, the top three, uh, myself, there's a lieutenant and sergeant, we're eligible to retire yesterday. So we are eligible to retire, which retirement age is age 50 and 25 years of service. The fourth person there in red is set to retire. He is currently in the DROP program. Uh, DROP is our retirement option. Uh, that officer will be leaving within two years. I believe it's about two years exactly. The officers in yellow are either eligible to retire, well, they are eligible to retire within five years. Some can leave next year, some can leave in two years, all of them can leave within five years. Um, so that's eight of the 18 are eligible to leave, 10, 10 of the 18 are eligible to leave within five years. As you can see, we're very, years of service, our average is up there pretty high. Um, and then we get, you know, a few in the eight years, then we have two in the seven years, and then we go down to one. Um, this pretty much says what, leading you into where we're heading uh, with, our, with my proposal. As you saw, there was four sergeants with four rotations. We're going to try and create a fifth squad, and that would consist of a sergeant, an officer, and I'm going to take those two bottom guys that were extra people, and they're going to work under the purview or under the supervision of that fifth squad. And the purpose of that fifth squad is going to be showing up. We would create a community resource unit. Fancy words for they're going to be designated to do certain tasks that uh, would be more proactive and not reactive. Our police department is pretty much a re, most police departments are pretty much reactive. We get a call, we respond to the call, we clear the call. Um, proactive response would mean trying to prevent a crime before it happens. So this community resource unit would be staggered. Uh, I would prefer them to be here more days of the week and not a 12 hour cycle. We would try and create a 10 hour cycle. Uh, it's going to be explained further as we go along. So those two officers to slide over to the fifth squad. They are still, I want to make this clear, they're still going to be a uniformed police officer, no matter what their extra titles may be and their other and their other jobs would be. Their, their primary focus is police work. The detective and the SRO would fall under that same fifth squad rotation as far as supervision. Right now, they're 
well, basically they're under my supervision, um, and they would stay there, but they're going to be assigned to this other squad to do more duties. Uh, the SRO for one, this would allow us for more, more flexibility at school, at different schools, to have other resource officers available when needed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't want to send different people of our schools that don't work. There we go. My five minutes must be up. <laughs> um, so keep, we can keep going. They're going to be an element of patrol division. Their primary focus, purpose, twofold. Commun keep going. <laughs> so community concerns. What concerns do we have in the community? Well, we're very, um, as, as you can easily see, we have a, several retirement homes in the community. We have a we have a higher elderly population. So criminals target two people. They target the elderly and they target the young. Well, we have a, a large elderly population and we have a very large daytime population of young students. So there, there are two concerns that you have in police work. Um, with Silver Stream, we have all the active communities, we have both ways. They're constant victims of crime. Uh, fraud, scams, this is who their, their, their primary focus is elderly people. What can we do to prevent that? Instead of just getting the call that such and such is lost money, we can go out. And the thing with, um, you know, my parents were elderly and we took cars away, we took their phone away, we did everything possible to prevent them from, you know, elderly people trust everybody. Um, you, we can go out and give talks, give presentations. The attorney general's office, the county, the state have professionals that come in and not always necessarily wearing uniform, but will speak to people on their level that they understand you can't trust everybody. Uh, we're all aware of all the scams. The, the, you know, you get a phone call, your son's been locked up and he needs money. Our residents fall for this scam. Our residents are victims of scams continuously. Uh, the, the, some of the sad cases at there it goes. I didn't touch it that time. Um, so we, we need to do this. We need to get out into our communities of our elderly populations repeatedly. You know, if there's four complexes, we can't go there once every once a year. We need to be there every month mm -hmm. and constantly addressing the same concerns because they're forgetful. Mm -hmm. um, so we need we can't hammer this enough to our elderly population. Uh, some of the other programs we do have, we have Alice training, um, which is um, for, for schools, run, hide, fight for schools. Our SRO does hidden hide and hit, hidden hide and hammer. It's a presentation on to parents on what to look for in your teenagers in the bedrooms of where kids hide drugs, where kids hide out. So we're finding more scams now. The batteries must be running low. Yeah. I'm gonna call that. Okay. Um, we're finding scams now that are targeting teenagers. <laughs> Uh, on the internet. I'm just like pointing it to you. Okay. <laughs> well, we're, finding, we're finding teenagers are being the victims of scams now over the internet. Um, they're being embarrassed and they're sending money to people because they're being embarrassed and they're afraid of their parents mm -hmm. finding out about it. Well, we need to let them know that this is happening, that, you know, don't fall for these scams. Don't fall for it. It's not just the elderly to fall for things. Um, so we have to worry about them also. Um, starting this year, the DA's office with uh, Montgomery County, we started the LEADY program, which is, um, it's a program designed for people who are, um, have a substance abuse problem, and in lieu of 
Maybe they've committed a crime, and or maybe they haven't committed a crime. Maybe they're just having a drug problem and they want help. This is a program that the DA's office has started where we can take somebody directly for treatment. We're becoming um, a society, a county, a police department of helpers and not just um, handcuffers. If I, if I, if I'm making this up as I go along, but that's what we're becoming. Um, and that's a good thing. And, and I fully support that. But all this takes time, all this takes resources um, to do this. Uh, going back to leading, uh, we currently have six officers trained. It's a, a full day program. It's done through St. Joe's. We're bringing them out here, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks to train us here. It's very hard to send you know, six people to St. Joe's for the day. So there's, they've started doing some regional training. We're going to bring them out to us. Uh, and like you say in the middle, in the middle there, if the first criminal charges, if somebody goes and gets help. So one of the biggest uh, responses or one of the biggest complaints, calls for service that we get are traffic complaints. You're all aware of them. You get them as much as I do. Um, I think I explained this to one of the board members before that. You know, uh, the way our shifts work, so Officer A today gets a call of a complaint of speeding on Plymouth Road, and he responds and he handles it today. He may not be back to work for another month on day work. So he's aware of the issue for one day. Tomorrow's officer doesn't know about the citizen's complaint. He doesn't read it in the report, which he should, but he doesn't read it firsthand or hear it firsthand. And, and it's a constant flow of, well, it's not my complaint, you know, the other officer handled it. Um, whereas, you know, it's our job, my job to direct them all to do this, but it becomes an issue of really commitment to get tra certain traffic complaints under control. It's also a time management thing. Um, we recently were out on Gypsy Hill Road for a few complaints at Gypsy Hill and Evans, and I read the reports and the officer would be there for seven minutes and he gets a call. So he leaves. The resident sees the officer there and he calls and says, he was there for seven minutes. I'm like, well, he, he, he will be back or she will be back, but there was other things that came about. So another, another proposed responsibility that we can throw on uh, a, a resort chair. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the middle there. If you can uh, take two seconds. That thing in the middle there is a stopwatch. In Pennsylvania, if you're a municipal police department, that's how we enforce speeding citations for municipal police departments. We use a stopwatch. We're the only state in the country that does not have radar. I know Danielle's aware of that. The only state. The only people authorized to use radar in Pennsylvania is the state police. So we use a stopwatch. Problems with the stopwatch. So we sit on something down pipe, we have lines in the road, we time the car. In order to stop that car, then that officer has to go twice as fast to catch that speeder. We don't want that. So in order to properly enforce speeding, it takes two officers, because you would radio ahead and stop such and such a car. More time. Um, we're also finding that perception is not always reality. Uh, we have this, our speed radar signs, we have the speed trailer sign. Our speed signs are now on Gypsy Hill Road um, for complaints. We've had them on Brookside Avenue, we've had them everywhere. When you collect data after a while and you're able to show somebody that perception is not reality, they're really not speeding that you think there is. There's always an outlier, but 85% of the public is usually doing the right thing. And it's good data to have that instead of just take my word for it for not speeding. That takes time. So another uh, issue where we're running into is um, we're all suffering from lack of manpower. The DA's office, the county detectives are no example. We have a fatal car crash. Uh, the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office assist us in this investigation. They're having, going to be facing some retirement soon. This takes expert training. It's weeks and weeks of 
uh, training to become a crash reconstructionist. So the North Penn departments, it was like seven of us who got together and we started our own North Penn crash team. We're going to look at not just fatal accidents. We're looking at serious traffic accidents also that could possibly prove, prove. There could be some liability on the township side. Maybe there should have been a sign there. It was a traffic light, different things like that, that it's not going to be dead set with somebody jumping. We're going to look at him, uh, the seriousness of the crash and what unique circumstances apply. We currently have one officer trained that can join this team. There's about 15 officers in the North Penn team. Uh, we'd like to add another officer. That's going to take some training. That's going to take a minimum probably six weeks of school. It doesn't happen all at once. You know, basic traffic accident school is two weeks. Just basic, advanced, Reconstruction, all these are two-week time cycles. Um, so we're looking at that. We have already we've already joined with North Penn um, to get their assistance, and, and we provided one officer of that. Um, early last middle of last year, um, myself and the other um, police departments that make up the Ambler NAACP. There's 10 of us. We signed an agreement to promote the reduction of bias in police and community relations. We're going to try and work with the community, with the NAACP. We've done this. We, we've hosted, we didn't host, we participated in a softball game with kids. Um, one of the biggest things, what I'd like to do is assign an officer to the North Penn Boys and Girls Club. Now you would say, North Penn doesn't involve Lower Glenning. It does. The North Penn chapter is located in Ambler also. The Ambler Boys and Girls Club has taken on the title, what you would say, of the North Penn Boys and Girls Club. I've been there, our SRO has been there. We would like to send other officers there. It's an incredible facility. If you haven't been there, you need to take a tour to see what they're doing. They're doing great things. Part of the hub program, we, we've agreed that we will have a hub program or a bridge pro program for juveniles, who get involved in the criminal justice system to have an alternative placement for them outside of the detention facility. So part of the, you know, the youth aid panel, some of us are familiar with the youth aid, aid panel. There's different programs that we can assist in getting a, a, a troubled youth into outside of just being the handcuffs again. Um, so we're, we're all really excited about that. North, the North Penn chiefs or departments that are involved in this, they, they, taught, they assign officers and they recently went, they had a bowling night, they've had miniature golf, they've gone to Freddie Hill, they've done all different fun things, fun activities that everybody's invited to. All kids throughout are invited to. It gets the police officers in front of kids in friendly, uh, spirited competition where we're not always in a uniform. And, and trust is a big thing. And we need to build trust with kids when they're young before they don't trust. So there, that's, that's the North Penn Boys and Girls Club. Uh, that's our, one of our SROs at Sanborn. So uh, what does this mean? All these things that we'd like to do. Can we do them under our current staffing? It's difficult. It would be difficult to do that. The proposal that I proposed in our budget is we would hire two additional officers. On the left, you see where we are today. On the right would be where we would go. And we would create that fifth squad. It would be run by a sergeant, an officer. We would take the two extra people on day work they would, if they're needed on day work, they're still on day work. If they're available, hey, maybe we have a day where we're running speed where we have three officers assigned. Um, maybe there's something going on where we're putting two officers out of school. We're doing um, a program at Springhouse Estates where we're gonna need two or three officers. Um, it, it, flexibility is huge and we, and we just don't have it. We just don't have the flexibility 
to be proactive and not always reactive. Mm -hmm. um, so that just basically says we're getting old. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm leading that flight. Um, um, I've been here 30, 37 years now, believe it or not. Um, and we're seeing, we're, we're, we're not top heavy on uh, rank, we're top heavy on age and years of service. And we need, you know, we're working on the, the fear, you know, we've had a rough year alone from all the other issues with the pandemic and everything else. But, you know, we currently are short two officers that are out on a disability. Um, that's created a, a huge issue for us in staffing. Uh, it's been very difficult. Um, when you have officers who have max vacation, max time off, it all adds up. And, you know, everything looks great on a schedule until you start pulling people off let alone the training that we're required to do. The state is constantly putting more efforts into training. Um, and we're following that, we're leading that in, you know, the world we live in, de-escalation. Um, today was the beginning of pretrial services. Um, <coughs> pretrial services is changing how we arrest people. Uh, and Montgomery County started it today. No longer does do your local district judges arraign people. It does not happen as of today. So we make an arrest today. They don't go to district court. The judge Leonard. All arrests now get processed at the county prison. Um, it's created a huge manpower problem for us. Today we had today we had a person real quick, real quick. I promise that. We had a person today turn himself in. <laughs> we had we had a person turn himself in today for for a warrant. Under normal circumstances, at last week, this person would have went to court, would have got arraigned in front of the judge. I believe bail would have been set. They would have been processed at whipping, and they'd been out there in forty five minutes. Today required two officers to take that person to whipping. They were processed, and then we took them to the county prison. And they would wait for an arraignment from a county judge sometime later today. Um, Why did they make that change? I don't know all the reasons. Part of it is bail reform. Part of it is the, um, I keep holding this up. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's not, um, in Montgomery County, there wasn't, um, things weren't necessarily happening the same for every person. <laughs> Some judge may set bail at two hundred thousand for something. Some may say two thousand. ROR, let them go. Okay. So we we become streamlining it. So. They haven't streamlined it. They made it more difficult okay. for us. They're making it better for all the the services that go along with it. But it created a lot of um, manpower issues for police, especially for for smaller police departments. It created a big problem because mm -hmm. we don't have cells here. Mm -hmm. So we have to depend on another department to process the prisoners. The prison has refused to process prisoners for us. They won't do the processing. We're working with the county. Um, I was going to speak to you about this afterwards. I don't want to get into too much online. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I, I don't know if it's going to. I am basically done. Yes. I want to thank you for doing this presentation. I have seen it before, but I wanted everyone to have the opportunity to see it as well as the public. Because um, I think it's very important to, to oh, talk. Yeah. Of, uh, I think it's very important to talk about um, the proactive ways you're trying to mitigate risk to our vulnerable populations. The ways that you're trying to transform the way policing has traditionally been thought of as um, a reactive type of interaction, as opposed to where one where services. Can be assisted or services provided and assist the navigation of accessing those services um so i know that it's transformative i know that it's on the you know you're on the cusp of the cutting edge of best practices the letty program is is one of those examples um and the way that you're prioritizing training for you know lower going to township mm -hmm. police i think is excellent so i wanted the community to know that 
all of the best practices in good governance that you're doing, that you know that you've taken that initiative and you know we're taking positive steps to move forward. So I thank you for, so much for that comprehensive. Uh, you know, I've, I've repeated it over and over. I know I thank God he stepped out. <laughs> we are, we are an incredible policing department. Yeah, it's yes. Yes. And it's the a siren. time machine consumer. Yes. Um, and we have to sure, thank God he does a lot of it. Yes. But, you know, you can't do all these things without spending time mm -hmm. and dedicating resources to it. Because our job one is to be reactive yes. and be available to react. Um, without that, we, we fail in the mission that we have. Um, so that's the best idea there was some staffing comparisons. That's it. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> are, I, I will be. I will be back to you shortly. Uh, we are giving a police test, a written test on Saturday. Uh, it's been well advertised, and the numbers are great. Well, I think they're great considering where they've been for the past, you know, couple times around. We have 284 applicants great. that are taking the test on Saturday. Um, we're in uh, the consortium with 15 other police departments. Okay. So. Where was it? Uh, we had barely a hundred. Yeah. The last test we gave in August, we had about a hundred with 96 candidates. Wow. Um, so we're thrilled to have 284. Um, there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of people hurrying to get through this because every one of us are short people. I, I, I didn't, I shouldn't say that if we want to expand, there are departments all around us that have lost people to retirements. You know, we just hired that one officer back in September. We were very lucky to get them, or we wouldn't have got anybody. We'd be sitting one, one officer short. Um, we're in the same boat with a lot of other departments that are short staffed. So, yes. Dave, uh, you go back to the best uh, screen here. Sure. I'd be interested in knowing uh, how many, uh, what's the population of each of these communities? <coughs> I could get you those numbers. Um, I I'm sure we're on the lower end of, we're, we're pretty par with Upper Gwinnett. I would think they're probably about 2,000 more. Yeah. We have about 11,000. I think Upper Gwinnett has about 13,000. What pain does anybody know? It's 25 or 26,000. Yeah. How's that compared with like Abington, that's about 40,000? Mm, I don't know. Well, just to give you a perspective of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Next on the agenda is the appointment of our volunteers for the Pike Fest Committee. We are still getting volunteer applications, which we're very excited about. I believe we have one applicant um, who applied to be on the Pike Fest. That is Natalie Melagrano. Um, it was included in our manager's report. Is there any questions from the supervisors? Any questions from the public? I'm going to move for us to appoint Natalie Melagrano to the Pike Fest Committee. Can I get a second? Second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. There we go. <laughs> and we are appointing Natalie Melagrano to the Pike Fest Committee. Thank you. Um, Next is the authorization to execute participation agreements for the opioid crisis. I don't know if Neil or you want to explain it, Neil? I can explain it. Okay. Um, Pennsylvania, along with uh, certain other states, entered into a settlement agreement with the opioid industry, whereby uh, Pennsylvania used to receive, while well, the overall settlement with the industry was $26 billion, uh, Pennsylvania used to receive approximately $1 billion of those settlement funds. As a part of that, I think the vast majority of counties in Pennsylvania have signed on to the agreement. Montgomery County is expected to receive approximately $35 million uh, of that settlement. Uh, the county is asking local municipalities uh, to join in the settlement. If the municipality elects not to join uh, in the settlement, there will be no funds available to that municipality uh, to assist with uh, the opioid crisis. So as a result, uh, Montgomery County has asked Lower Gwinnett and others uh, to join in the settlement framework. 
Um, I'm not sure if the agreement is up, up or if you can put it up for everyone to see. Um, is there any questions from the Board of Supervisors? To whom did the uh, $26 billion settlement, who was that directed to? That was directed to a number of states. Um, it was a bipartisan group of states that elected to enter into a settlement agreement rather than litigate individually okay. with these very large drug companies. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you litigate, there's no guarantee you would win that right. litigation. I didn't know if it were federal or state money or what. Thank you. Will, will, does the money come to us with strings attached? There's a very exhaustive list. Uh, it was exhibit E to the settlement agreement. A very exhaustive list of what the money can be used for. Um, certain specific activities um, related to opioid issues. You couldn't take the money, for example, and use it to fill potholes. Um, it has to be specifically earmarked for one of the or more of the designated activities on Exhibit E. Okay. And our choices are take it or not take it. That's essentially what the choice is. Okay. So I would imagine all municipalities are signing on as a matter of course. Yeah, um, and most counties as well, because it trickles down from the state right. to the county and then the municipalities. Okay. Is there any other questions from the Board of Supervisors? Anyone on the board? Is there any other questions from the public? Or comments? So I'm going to make a motion to approve the authorization um, for execution of participation agreement with the opioid crisis. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. There we go. We're authorizing to execute participation agreements for opioid crisis. It was approved. Um, next is uh, authorization for staff to set up interviews for professionals to identify redevelopment concepts for Township Park. Um, we did receive um, a plan that was circulated by our engineer um, to everyone, I think, in the manager's report. Um, I think our engineer would like that opportunity to revise that plan. So I'm going to uh, make a request that we table this authorization for staff to set up the interviews. Um, is there a second? I'm second. sorry, for what reason, Chairman? The, our, our engineer has requested the ability to um, uh, update or revamp the, the plan that was shared with you on Friday in the manager's report. Okay. Um, given that request, uh, I'm, I'm making a motion to table this. The authorization to set up the interviews for professionals to identify the redevelopment. I second costs. that motion. Thank you. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 There we go. So it has been approved that we are going to table the staff set up. Um, the authorization authorization to solicit bids for the Dagger Road Trail. Um, is that the front of us? Craig, are you? Are you, is the microphone working? Yes, it is. Okay. Can you give us some background on this? This is, um, I know Chad Dixon is on the, the call, maybe okay. since he submitted the uh, the grant application, why don't we have Chad? Okay. Sure. Uh, just as a quick summary, um, back in the spring of 2021, the township um, applied for and received a grant from Montgomery County as part of their 2040 program to upgrade the existing um, uh, pedestrian crossing on Dagger Red for the Penland Trail um, to put in a rapid flashing um, beacon in it to crossing to make it a safer condition. It's a trail that's um, heavily used by um, school students in the area and it's um, it was a um, issue that it's been brought up over time by residents in terms of improvements that could be made there. So over the last few months, we've been going through the permitting process with PennDOT and also um, Montgomery County. And we're in the process of um, signing all the permits and finalizing everything. And now we are ready to solicit bids. Um, so we're seeking authorization from the board to prepare the bid documents and then put um, advertise uh, the project uh, this spring, the tentative schedule 
that we've put together is to um, post the project on PEMBID um, around March 8th, um, open bids um, around April 12th, and come back to the board at its second meeting in April to hopefully uh, and approve a bidder um, for the project and then to go to construction um, after that. So um, that's a quick summary. And if anybody has any questions, be happy to answer those for you. I don't have any questions. Is there any other questions by members of the board? Is this um, something that's already in our budget for this year? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. This is the, the crosswalk down near Bethlehem Baptist Church. Oh. Crossing over to the, I'll say the school district side okay. of Digger Road. We're trying to straighten that out so it's not on an angle. Put some flashers on there to make it a little more safe. Yeah, okay. that's a good I one. I was thinking of the other end of Digger Road. Yeah. yeah, okay, I got it. Thanks. I'm making a motion to authorize the solicitation of bids for the Digger Road track. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 There we go. <laughs> It has been approved that we're authorizing to solicit bids for the Dagger Road Trail. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Um, next on the agenda is the Northern Montgomery County Recycling Commission Compost Agreement Renewal. Uh, I don't know if that letter is able to be put up, but there's a letter that we received um, as a solicitor for the Northern Montgomery County Recycling Commission. They require municipalities who do not have curbside pickup for leaf and yard waste at least one time per month to designate an official PADEP permitted compost facilities for residents, haulers, and contractors to drop off at per location. Um, this would be to enter into this agreement uh, for 2022 and subsequent years. It's substantially similar to past years. So the following highlights you can see listed above. Act 101 requires official designation of a compost facility. Um, it seems pretty straightforward to me. Is there any questions from any other members of the board? Mm -mm. Is there no. any questions from anybody online or the public? No. So I'll move forward for us to authorize the Northern Montgomery County Recycling Commission Compost Agreement Renewal um, with Whistler. Is it? Are we? It's Whistler Pearlstein. Yeah. The I'm sorry, I think my computer phone's with Whistler Pearlstein. Um, is there a second? A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. We are authorizing Mr. Pearl sign for the North Northern Montgomery County Recycling Commission Compost Agreement. Lower Gwinnett Township. The next is the authorization to advertise the Lower Gwinnett proposed ordinance um, and its supervisor term limits. Um, it was included, I think, for the past two managers' reports to the Board of Supervisors. I don't know if you can bring up the authorization. Essentially, um, the proposed ordinance, this is the authorization to advertise um, a restriction for the number of terms that each supervisor would be able to, to pr provide to Lower Gwinnett Township. So it would be a totality of two terms, which equates to 12 years, which is a significant period of time. Um, my opinion, and this is something that I asked a solicitor to draft, I think it is best practices and it is in line with good governance for us to allow the opportunity for others interested in serving and volunteering in our township. The ability to provide and, and serve as a township supervisor. Um, the only restriction would be that it's two term, two consecutive or contiguous terms, and then you could take a term off and run again if so desired. Um, that was my reasoning for asking the solicitor, but I'm opening it up to other members of the board, if they wanted to explain any um, any concerns or agreement that they have with the, with the ordinance. So I have a comment um, it, that doesn't necessarily go to the merits of the ordinance, but um, I think when we're talking about a policy change like this or initiative, and this also applies to the um, resolution that we passed two weeks ago regarding the five-year review of professional contracts and also um, the side ordinance that's being uh, circulated about the sponsorship signs in our little league. Those are policy initiatives that I think should properly come before the board in a public uh, meeting for 
proposal and um, debate on before we actually authorize the staff to do any work, drafting of ordinances or resolutions. We're kind of putting the cart before the horse with this process. So I would ask that my fellow supervisor, I don't know who, um, well, you just said that you asked Neil to write this, to uh, draft this proposal. I think that that should have come from the full board unanimously or uh, majority vote to have our staff um, execute policy that we decide to move forward on. Um, and again, that, that relates to um, those other two items that I pointed out as well. So that's my comment. Um, and if I recall on paragraph C, um, I don't think that we'll ever be in a position where three years will be remaining on an appointment because when you're appointed to the supervisors, you, you must run in the next municipal election and those elections occur every two years. So am I reading this correctly, right, Neil? Paragraph C. Yeah. Did not complete his or her term with three years or more remaining on said term. So that would mean if you were elected and then resigned within the first two years. Right. So you could theoretically resign within the first two years of your term and then not okay. be your term for. Okay. Kathleen, are you saying that somebody should be uh, required to run as soon as they're able to run? And so that would limit it to two years? Well, the township code requires if you're an appointed supervisor, you're required to run in the immediate following um, municipal election. So I was misreading that. Is there any other comments from any other members of the board? Yeah, I would comment that I, I respectfully, Kathy, I, I disagree that, I disagree with the, how you propose things should be brought out for the public to consider. That's why we were elected. And I can tell you that I heard comments about term limits when I was campaigning just this past year. So. I think that's why we get elected to bring up ideas that might be new or different, but that still have value and merit. And I don't think we should vote for whether staff should do work or not. I mean, that's sort of one of the prerogatives of, of the chair and certainly was the prerogative of the last few chairs that I'm aware of. So I, I think the process has worked fine for all these years and it's essentially still the same process. And the public, of course, is going to have an opportunity to discuss this. That's why we advertised it. And um, I think it's, I agree with Danielle, it's good government. And it allows others to have the opportunity to participate in the process. Well, again, I'm not speaking to the merits of the uh, proposal to the term limits. I'm agnostic on it. And I do agree that, you know, if it could be good governance. I'm just um, questioning the process of policy being advocated to our staff by one or two supervisors given direction on policy without it first being debated in a public meeting amongst all the supervisors and either by unanimous and majority vote directing that that change in policy be effectuated by whatever means it should be effectuated by staff. So again, it's not about the merits, it's about the process. So just to clarify, I just want yeah, to make sure I, I understand. Um, the court, I mean, the Sunshine Act kind of limits our ability to debate topics at length outside of the public forum. Sure. But the, so the suggestion is to bring an idea, to place the idea on the agenda without any actual formalized information or supporting documents or even, you know, a resolution drafted and then have a conversation about what it could or would potentially look like. Had we draft, have we actually instructed staff to do that? And then from that conversation, bring it back to authorize yeah, I mean, the actual circulation it of there. it. Right. Okay. Um, and some of this stuff can be done, you know, in the executive session. It can't. Well, when we're doing, 
if it's those certain except no i asked i am saying specifically yeah. it cannot yeah. i i've read the sunshine act kind of thoroughly and i've mm -hmm. asked millions of questions of neil <laughs> <laughs> to ensure that i'm adhering to the law as as mm -hmm. closely as possible it seems that without actually having the information in front of you it would just be a mere discussion and I, you know mm -hmm. as far as best practices that i have seen in other municipalities this appears to be the consensus as to the most effective way and use of staff's time to get that accomplished. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying and, and the Sunshine Act kind of precludes that conversation at random, almost whimsically as it relates to policy changes that we would want to address. And like kind of to, to um, Mike's point, I had not seen this happen in previous administrations or, or by previous chairman for Lower Gwinnett, but me wanting to do kind of best practices, I looked at lower, I looked at Upper Gwinnett, Montgomery, Lansdale, Whitpain, Upper Dublin, and this seems to be consistent um, with the most effective use of staff's time. So once policy initiatives are in, introduced, there is an ordinance or a resolution to address them, to have the conversation. It's advertised and then the conversation commences. Thank you for listening. Is there any other comments from anyone on the board? Is there any comments from the public or anyone online? No. So we have a, mo a motion. Well, no, we have a, the authorization to advertise Lower Gwinnett proposed ordinance in front of us. I'm going to make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Motion passes. And I believe we'll be advertising this for the February 28th. Yes, for the February 28th, 2022 meeting. Um, next are um, authorizations to advertise for a public works foreman. Um, I believe those positions were included in the manager's report or the description of those positions. I don't know if you have time to bring it up, Jamie. Um, but the first is for a public works foreman. We are in need of a public works foreman. It identifies the summary job description and qualification desired. Um, is there any questions from anyone on the board? Is there any questions from um, anyone in the public or online? Okay. So I'm gonna go forward with an authorization to advertise for the public works foreman. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Motion passes. Um, for authorization to advertise for a public works form. And next is the authorization to advertise for a part time park attendance. Again, I believe the job description was included in the manager's report. I don't have that. You don't have it from here. Okay. Yeah, um, it, the hours are, are week and weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, average of 20 hours per week. The rate is $10 an hour. The position title is park attendant. The status is seasonal, March through October, and it is non-exempt. Um, the purpose of the position I'm reading, just because we don't have it to provide, is to protect, secure, and maintain Penland Woods and Penland Park, a multi-purpose active re recreational facility in Lower Gwinnett Township. Um, the duties, job functions, and re responsibilities will be included in the advertisement. Is there any questions from anybody on the board of supervisors? I just had one question. Um, is it limited, you know, is their role just limited to Penland Woods and Penland Park, Craig, or is it, in, you know, does it encompass the other parks if the need? Required? It's mainly Penland Woods and Penland Park, but if it's needed in at Ingersoll or any Oxford Park, they would be assigned to those positions as well. Okay, fair enough. And I just have one question. Is, the, is there, it's always been 21 years or older? We don't do any kind of older high school kids? Um, it's always been 21 years and older, but I would imagine we could go to 18 and older. That would be my only recommendation because because I know that a lot of high school kids over the summer are looking for job opportunities and this kind of makes the most sense. We can certainly change that, yes. Okay. Um, do they so have did, to get, I'm sorry, do they have to get their um, background check? Yeah, they would get the background checks and the child abuse and all that because they would be working in the parks where more the, the camps could be there across camps or anything like that. Neil, is it okay for us to make that minor change to the 
Okay. Yes. So would that park attendant job description change that that would allow 18 with a minimum age of 18? Um, is there any other question from the board of supervisors? Any question from the public um, or anyone online? No. I'm going to make a motion to approve the advertisement for the part-time park attendant. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And we have an approval to authorize to advertise for the part-time park attendants. Next is the authorization to advertise for the public work summer help. Um, again, I don't have that job description. I don't know if you're able to give us a brief. Yes, that, um, I do not have that description in the, uh, the manager's report. We're still working on that, but we, uh, we were pushing through last week and um, I did not have that job description out there, but basically it's someone to help public works or perhaps two people to help public works during the summer, picking up trash in the parks, um, cutting uh, along their trails or easements, um, anything really needed. Um, Fred, anything more on that? Yeah, a laborer, basically a laborer position. Um. It's a great job. I did it for two suburbs in my township. <laughs> I just have two questions. Are we paying $10 an hour? And is there a minimum age of 21 or is it 18? Last year we advertised higher than $10 an hour. We did not get any applications. I think maybe because we're hiring at a wage that most people over 21 can't afford to mm -hmm. operate or live life on. It's not a livable wage. Yeah, um, this would not be well, uh, summer this, jobs. These are for these are for like summer kids. Correct. Well, that's what I was saying. If this it goes down to 18 yeah, not years 21. of age, you might get more applicants. Well, that was that's the park attendance. That's no, that's I'm something different. for this one too. The summer help was it is 21. 16. Well, we need someone to drive. Oh, 16. 16. Okay. We need someone that can operate a vehicle. It is a great job. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. And what a boss. <laughs> so it's I was talking be, about Fred. It's going to be for two, 16 years. Yeah, well, we're hoping for two. Okay. And is it 12 or is it 10? I can uh, pull that job description and update that and put it in the packet. Okay, so you want to table it? We can table it till the 28th. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to table the advertisement for the public works help? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 So we're tabling the authorization to advertise for public works help until we get the full job description, pay rate and minimum age. Next is committee reports. Um, I believe the only committee that met is the EAC. Is I don't know if uh, Cassie or Janine, or, do you guys want to get a, a brief update? And I say brief because it's almost nine. <laughs> of what happened at the EAC meeting? Uh, so um, I would just comment a, a few things. Uh, the, the EAC is um, starting to discuss and planning for um, questions uh, to include in a survey of the residents to get input on environmental initiatives. Um, and then there is a strategy that's going to be developed for uh, the tree giveaway. So they'll, they'll come to us and then the board uh, with a proposal. And um, there's a, a new committee, subcommittee, uh, of the EAC, uh, which is going to be dealing with energy conservation in the township. And uh, their first uh, kickoff meeting is on 22nd of February. And the public is invited to join in for this discussion and brainstorming. So that's next Tuesday, the 22nd. Um, is it going to be hybrid online or in person? I think it's just in person. We okay. actually that raises a good point um, that 
well, we don't have time to talk about it now, but it, there, there needs to be a mechanism for subcommittees to have access to um, the township um, AV and Zoom meetings, but we can discuss that offline. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tessa. Um, I don't believe that any other committees have met. Is that accurate? Okay. Um, next would be, I see that we have public comment. Is that anyone here with us have public comment or online? I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Seeing none, we're moving on to the manager's report. Craig? Um, just uh, the township offices are closed Monday for President's Day. Like that brief, Matt. Thank you. So much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to supervisor comments before Craig turns off the lights. Tessie, you want to go first? Uh, no, no further comments. Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> Kathleen? Just real briefly, Madam Chair, do we have, are we beginning the process of populating the two new um, subcommittees? Yes. Historical and um, Bethlehem revitalization? Yes, so we've received many applications. We haven't shut down those applications. I wanted them to continue throughout the month of February, but to stop as of February 28th, which is the last day in February. So they have been well over a month, a little bit, you know, a couple more weeks. And then kind of start that process of having conversations about those those two committees. So yes. Okay. That, that's a great question, Kathleen. So I can't remember, is that advertised in our bulletin that's going to be coming out? I think it is. The paper newsletter? I think yes. it'll be too late for that. Yeah. Oh. Because that's not going to arrive till the spring, correct? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But I think it can go out in our e-blast or next e-blast. Okay. Great. Is that all, uh, Kathleen? Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, Janine, you want to go first? Uh, I got nothing. Just happy Valentine's Day. And <laughs> it was a great, great sharing my Valentine's Day with you all. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you want to go? How, how many years have you been Who can talk that? Good. <laughs> um, okay. I just want to thank you guys all for coming and, and participating. I want to thank the chief for that, uh, that presentation. Um, I want everyone to enjoy their Valentine's Day and their President's Day weekend. I'm going to actually ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Can I get a motion? So uh, moved. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's scary. I don't know. Do we? Did we ever get another microphone? Oh. We're still on, uh, it's ordered. We ordered two, but they're um, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 they're just waiting for it to come in.